Sometimes all you get is bad head days The fear of the demon The voices in your head Crouching in your little world Where everything you see Sometimes it's easy To run away from yourself Unfortunately, do not have a guest, uh, as per previous weeks. There was quite a few people invited this week, but nobody decided that they were going to participate. So it seems very quiet here today. I don't know what's going on. I think I'm going to see if I can find the uh, 
Creative Commons background music just to have like a little bit of something in the background. What's going on? Oh, there we go. The, uh, but this is the second week that I have been self-isolated. You might recall from the last week that I, the week before, uh, had a COVID scare. Thankfully, it turned out to not be a an actual COVID scare. So far, COVID has not taken either my life or any of the health of the people in at least my immediate vicinity, although there was kind of a worry of that over the past week or two, and I had been in my apartment for basically the entirety of the week. I was slowly cracking under the <laughs> self-imposed isolation, but that has been my week. So, But one of the interesting things that came out of this past week or so was the COVID test itself. And I, I wish I could remember what I, all the things that I talked about last week. But one of the things that I probably should have gone more in detail about is the test itself and how the the procedure was, where basically I went with a couple others. We went to the, the testing facility here in Saskatchewan, or here in Saskatoon, North Saskatoon specifically, and a little bit of an adventure getting there, which uh, I won't quite get into that part, but the had a glass walled entrance that you had to basically get permission to enter. In front of the glass walled entrance, they had the masks that we were told that we couldn't bring our own masks. We had to use their masks, which was kind of odd because they were stacked in a pile and the pile you had to basically pull one off of, but it was super easy to touch the mask underneath it. So if any of the people that I went with had actually had COVID, it was very easy to accidentally touch the next person's mask. So that would be kind of like an unfortunate thing, right? To go to the testing facility run by the SHA here in Saskatchewan and then not have COVID, think that you've got it exposed, grab a mask, put it on your face, right around your mucous membranes, and then it just so happened that the previous person who was there had COVID, had touched the mask, and then now you're being tested, you're gonna test negative because you don't have it, and then you'll slowly develop it over the next week. That, that's one possible outcome. Didn't seem to happen to me or the people I went with, but that was kind of interesting on its own. So then they like, social distance walked us along this wall, positioning us so that we were separated enough from each other so that it was kind of like a, a normal line in this new normal. Then we were directed to go to a, a room and wait for a nurse. The nurse winds up coming, asks us some questions, and unfortunately I noticed right away that the questions, they're basically uh, preemptively assuming that if you have any COVID symptoms at all, you, it's a COVID symptom. And so there's like no guessing, oh, maybe this is, maybe this isn't. It's, do you have a, what was it, runny nose, sneezing, sore muscles? And then they had like a list of 20 different things, which it's easy to have, especially for those of us who are getting older, these kinds of symptoms start to be just the normal. And so you can't say no, right? You, can, you can't say no, yeah, my muscles are sore. Well, yeah, that's just how things are for me at this middle age, right? You do stupid things, you get sore afterwards. But the point here is that it's very easy for them to tick off the little checkbox that says, now you're self-isolated. And that little checkbox, once they tick it, that is a medical health professional telling you to self-isolate. And part of the problem in the past couple of months here around North America is not enough people are paying attention to what medical health professionals are saying. And far be it from me to be the person to not follow what the nurse tells me to do. I am not a nurse. I do not have the training of that level of health science. And so when I am told to self-isolate, I self-isolate. And I hope the rest of you hearing this do the same thing if you're told. But nevertheless, it was still kind of a little bit, probably a little on the over the top side on that side. But then of course they do the swab, they stick the swab up right up your nose. I kind of expected to like feel, I don't know really how to describe what I expected, but I, I, I expected it to feel deeper, but it was certainly uncomfortable uh, having a basically equivalent of a Q-tip or something like that put like right, right up your nose. And there was a little bit of pain there. I thought it was gonna be a little bit more painful, honestly. And I, it did actually kind of hit the, the tear. Like it, it's kind of like getting punched in the nose and that even if the pain isn't really that bad and even if you haven't broken your nose and even if it's not like a, a really bad feel, I mean, it's never a good feeling to get punched in the nose, but you know, I've, you get hit in the nose hard enough 
the tear ducts in your eyes start going and you start to cry no matter what pretty much and that kind of happened to me so I was, it's, it's more embarrassing than anything um, but that was kind of my experience with that and then of course they like shoo you off to, to go wait and isolate and wait until the test results but here's the interesting part or one of the interesting parts the test results came back yesterday I got the test like 10 days before yesterday and the test results only came back yesterday so had I actually gotten COVID, I would have probably known, unless I was one of the super carriers or whatever that don't get any of the symptoms but still get positive, then who knows, maybe that would have been different. But 10 days is a long time for this particular pathogen. And I isolated those 10 days. I didn't go out, I didn't talk to anyone, I just stayed in my place and didn't encounter the rest of the world. But I can't imagine the majority of the people in this province who are being told Oh yeah, you work at a grocery store and you, one of your customers had COVID and now you got to get tested and the 10 days of a delay is way too long, especially since they tell you right up front, the test itself only takes two or two to three days. And by the third day you should know and they'll tell you, but they didn't, they waited and waited and waited. And then of course the best part is that they didn't even give me my details. They just contacted the people that I was with because Again, everything in this province is done over the phone, and we have this provincial telephone company, so at least there's that. But that's kind of how that process works. So, And then, of course, the other fun part is trying to get back to them, because I personally don't have a phone. And so the experience today was trying to see if I could find a phone that I could call them with. And I went out looking for a payphone. I had a, quite the experience trying to find the payphone. But I did wind up finding a, a payphone. And so here's the process so far. So you, you get exposed, you're encouraged by the, go to the website for the SHA here in Saskatchewan. They walk you through a series of questions and then if there's any risk at all, they would say call 811. 811 being the number here in Saskatchewan for if you need to be tested. And then if 811 says to self-isolate, you should self-isolate. If they say to get tested, you go and get tested. And at that point, it's in the hands of a medical professional. Well, if you don't have a phone, you could, in principle, use Google or some kind of voice over IP thing on the internet to call, but they block all of those numbers. So you have to actually go to either a pay phone or have someone you know who has a phone. And of course, the waiting time to get hold of a nurse through 811 is in the many hours. I think one day we waited like 12 hours or eight hours or something like that. It was, I don't know the exact number, but it was a really long time. And so it's not the sort of thing that you could just ask a friend and say, hey, can I like get you to sit on hold for me for your whole weekend? That's not a reasonable thing to ask of most people. So most people are not gonna have the ability to ask a friend to do it uh, if they don't have a phone. And then the other thing you could do is you could go to a payphone, but as I learned today, payphones in this province cost $3 a minute per minute to get access to 811. And I mean, I brought some change. I probably actually brought enough to get like two minutes worth of call time to 811, but you can't get anything through in two minutes. Like you get through and then they put you on hold. Right? So you could be sitting on hold for, you could have a, an hour long conversation after sitting on hold for like eight, six to eight hours, and who knows how much of that you're going to be paying for. So it's virtually impossible to get through on a payphone, and nobody has that kind of money to spend $3 a minute on getting access to a, a nurse who's all they're going to tell you is, yes, you have it, no, you don't, and yes, you're dying, go to the emergency, no, you aren't. So the whole thing is unreasonable and broken at this point. And so if you are, are listening to me, I, I, would, I wouldn't take my word on this. I would go see if you can find a payphone in your, uh, if you live in Saskatchewan, of course, and find a payphone, dial 811, just like see if what it tells you and listen to the message and verify for yourself that it costs as much as I say it does. And then once you've done that, get a hold of SaskTel and get a hold of your MLA. And between the two of them, I'm not sure who is the best lever to push on this, but this is something we should be fixing in this province, like in the short term. This is something that directly impacts our ability to deal with COVID. And yeah, there's not that many payphones around as compared to what there used to be, but still, it's a public service that allows people to have access to things like emergency medical assistance along the lines of like non-life-threatening at this very moment, which 
that sort of assistance you'd want to go to 911. But do they do the same for 911? Like, is that going to be how things work in this province from going forward? Anyway, so that's my big COVID story for the week. But that's not the only thing that's been going on for the past little while. I found this week an interesting little fact that I did not know up until, well, this week. Even though it was something that happened during my life, and I should actually remember this, had the news covered it at the time, and had we probably known about it at the time, and that is the Norwegian rocket incident. And I've got a Wikipedia article here, I'll post after the show, which is, quote, the Norwegian rocket incident known as the Black Brandt Scare occurred on January 25, 1995. So this, I would have been, what, like 12? Yeah, 12. Just turn 12. When a team of Norwegian and US scientists launched the Black Brandt 12 four-stage sounding rocket from the Andoya rocket range off the northwestern coast of Norway. The rocket carried scientific equipment to study the Aurora Borealis over Svalbard and flew on a northbound trajectory, which included an air corridor that stretches from the Minuteman 3 nuclear missile silos in North Dakota all the way to the Russian capital city of Moscow. The rocket eventually reached an altitude of 1,453 kilometers. Ooh, that's starting to get pretty high. 903 miles, resembling a U.S. Navy or submarine-launched Trident missile. The Russian nuclear forces were put on high alert as a result, fearing a high-altitude nuclear attack that could blind Russian radar and Russia's, quote, nuclear briefcase, the Cheget, if I'm pronouncing that right, was brought to Russian president at the time, Boris Yeltsin, who then decided whether or not to launch a retaliatory nuclear strike against the United States. Of course, we know the outcome of this, right? We know that Yeltsin didn't hit that button. We know that he was sober enough to know not to hit that button. But still, the fact was that the red button of Russia came out. His hand would have been at least in the vicinity of hitting that button. All of our lives since 1995, which for some listeners and of this show may even be your entire life, is due to the fact that Boris Yeltsin, when given the choice, not to destroy the world, chose not to destroy the world. Quote, Russian observers determined that there was no nuclear attack and did not retaliate. They go into a little bit of the scenarios here of that they were fearing that it might be an EMP, why it was kind of like a similar kind of missile to what they were kind of looking for. But regardless of the exact details further than this, it is worth remembering that this isn't just something that happens in movies. This isn't just a War Games, Disney, Pixar, or whatever the company is that made War Games, imagination of, oh, this could happen, and wouldn't it be uh, terrible if the whole world ended because somebody did something that freaked out missile detection system, that, you know, some red balloon or something messes with our ability to see, understand what our adversary across the Iron Curtain or former Iron Curtain is doing, and then, boom, everyone dies. This is something that happened. This is something that happened in our lifetime, or at least my lifetime, and could easily have escalated beyond where it did. And it was only because of one person, Boris Yeltsin, that we are alive today. So this is still a little bit broken. We still have this buildup of arms on both sides of Russia and the United States, and now uh, increasingly other countries. And we still are involved in negotiations of how to deal with this situation with the New Open Skies Initiative, etc. But it's worth remembering that this does happen. This has happened. 1995 is not that long ago. It is recent and directly applicable to our lives, this incident. So it's worth knowing about and it's worth teaching about. If this isn't, like, I don't remember learning this in school, maybe in part because how much of this, like, how long did it take before the Western world was really aware of this? And it doesn't really say too much of that uh, in the Wikipedia article, but that would be kind of interesting to know. The sources cited here date to the 1999, a book uh, from one Peter Pry, and then the rest are in the 2000s. So this is a, it took a while for us to know that this had even happened, which is kind of interesting to know on its own. But that's not the only thing going on in the world. Somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, why am I not on the radio? That I've, I've got all these different sources. I've got Mega, I've got BitChute, I've got YouTube, I've got Facebook. I haven't put anything on Twitch, but I do 
intend at some point to, to try to like get more broadcast options, including Twitch. So that would be like the next step if I had the people available to, to help out with that. Uh, but why am I not even remotely interested in being on the radio? And the reason is that the radio is a regulated resource here in North America. And it has been for a long time. It used to be in the history of radio that you could set up a broadcaster, uh, an antenna, and start talking into the microphone. And if you could get an audience to pay attention to you, then all the better. That used to be how it worked. It used to be very much like the early internet in that sense. That if what mattered was what you said, how well you connected to your audience, and the importance of what you were doing, rather than the power of the gatekeepers who control the broadcast stations. And very early on in radio's history, there was a big movement in both the States and in Canada to change that, and to change the way the law dealt with radio so that the big companies involved, or at least the companies involved, could control who had access to the ability to broadcast. And I don't remember who it was who said it, but it was I think someone in the US government said it was the first time in his awareness or his understanding of history that uh, companies had begged the government to regulate them, that they had begged the government to step in and to create rules and regulations and onerous restrictions on who could have a radio station and who could own them. And even though there weren't companies like Clear Channel around back then that now own, or at least fairly recently own, radio stations across North America, it was still well understood that if you could keep the rabble rousers out, and if you could keep the individuals who just wanted to connect people out, what you could turn radio into is a means of advertising and a means of controlling public opinion and a means of manipulating the minds of the public because there would be no voice to stand up against it. There'd be no voice to be critical of the companies who were participating in that. There'd be no way for people to stand up against the equivalent of the public relations masterminds of the day and say, no, actually what you're doing is manipulative and it's not in the best interest of whatever group we want to be kind of going into. And so very early on, radio was captured, it was regulated, it was enclosed, it was turned into a commercial product. And this continues to this day. Now there are community radio stations here in Saskatchewan, but there are still rules of what you can and cannot say. There are rules of what words you can use, what words you can get in trouble for, and what words you can get banned off the airwaves for using. There are, in addition to the rules, norms of what kinds of things you can criticize and what kinds of statements you can make. And in general, unless you are of a particular political bent, you're just not going to get on the airwaves. It's just, especially in commercial radio, like there is so much you can do to get permanently banned from commercial radio. And it, off the hook, the radio show that's on WBAI in New York goes into some of the people who have been kicked off of commercial radio in some of their shows. It's worth kind of going into that. But they exist and they're able to get around that because of an accident of history. That in the past, in the United States, a fairly wealthy person just gave a community a radio station. And so they have managed to keep it running in the States, although they've had their problems too. They have woo and pseudoscientific products that occasionally they'll huck at their unsuspecting listeners rather than have commercials and to some extent it's kind of the same sort of thing but they at least keep a little bit of independence in a way that virtually no radio station in the rest of the world does and that independence has been slowly bleeding away it, it does still exist but in for example the local community radio station you're just not going to see that and it, there are certain things you can do on the radio that if you do it, that's that's it. You're never going to go on the radio again. Whereas here, I could say whatever I want. I could go completely against the political powers of the day. And there may be consequences in my personal life, but I can keep this broadcast on the internet. There are places that I can put it where it's going to be permanently etched, or at least as permanent as the internet is, or, or something close to it. The Usenet groups are finally starting to wither away and bit rot, starting to to get it. I heard this week, I think it was comp.lisp, Google's copy, which is one of the last full copies of it, they're removing access to it because of spam, which is kind of a really bad excuse to purge something of that historic value 
Uh, so maybe the Usenet groups aren't quite the permanent uh, storage of data that they used to be. But certainly there's places still left on the internet where you can take an MP3, you can take a radio show, and you can make it so that if people actually want to hear it, they'll be able to find it. The Internet Archive is still today functional as a place like that, but they're not alone. There are other places still left, and sure, maybe I could get kicked off of them too, but it's worth just pointing out that there is this political problem in North America that the radio stations are a highly controlled thing, and there is a world of outside of the Overton window you can expect on both commercial and community radio. And personally, I live in that world. I don't choose to have what I think determined by the winds of political change as they blow day by day and week by week. I read books that are older than the attention span of the people on Twitter. I listen to radio shows that are from longer ago than some of, again, the listeners of this show have been alive. I have ideas that are not politically correct in some cases. But nevertheless, I'm here to defend them. I'm here to provide to the marketplace of ideas my view of the world. And speaking of the marketplace of ideas, I read a couple of papers over the past uh, couple of weeks on what's called the dispositionism epidemic. Which is kind of interesting because everyone wants their cause to be an epidemic right now. Uh, because there's a lot of political sway in being able to say something's an epidemic. And there is this question of, well, how, how do we react to this, the COVID epidemic? And then if we can react that way to the COVID epidemic, is there anything else we can fix, etc. But the idea behind it is dispositionism epidemic is the question of what do we do with this obesity crisis that we have? And how do we deal with the fact that so many people in North America are getting fat? And you can look at it as a, well, people are getting older, and especially for men, for sure, middle-aged men, one of the things that happens to you is it gets really easy uh, to not be in as good of shape as you were when you were 18. And specifically, it gets easy to gain a little bit of weight, especially if you're not very, very vigilant about your diet and exercise routine. And if you drink just that little bit too much, you'll get a little tubby. It's, it happens so easily. And so I read this paper, and I'm noticing now that I don't actually have the link to the paper itself, which is kind of embarrassing. But the idea being is that we would like to think that when we choose how much to eat and what to eat and how to arrange our diet and uh, whether to go for fast food or not, and all of these kinds of questions that wind up determining whether or not we're tubby. That at least here in North America, that we're free. We are. We live in this culture that has a constitutional right to choose uh, what we eat and how much we eat. And the government isn't quite at the point of giving us chocolate rations like 1984 and then slowly decreasing them while telling us that it's increasing or something. That we do get a chance to decide our diet and to live to our diet to the best of our ability. Maybe sometimes we can't afford as much as we'd like a healthy choices and there are issues relating to poverty but even outside the questions of access to affordable food that are that is healthy it turns out that a lot of the time our choices are not as determined by our free will as we would like to believe and maybe we can get into the question of how much of it is actually free will a little bit but just as an example one little tiny data point that they talked about was borderline anorexic teenage girls and you would think that of all the groups, of all the people who pay attention to what they eat and how much they eat, that girls who have an, a problem with their weight and their self-image and being able to uh, overdo not eating enough to maintain a healthy body weight, even they, quote, can't actually or accurately gauge how big of a portion size they're eating if you mess with the size of their balls. And that's all you have to do to mess with their perception of the world is change just the size of the, the shape of their bowl. And if that is true for anorexic girls, that's definitely true for you, the listener, and me, the person who is now into their middle age. Just the size of the portion. 
Just the size of the bowl or the plate that you're eating on, that alone messes with you. There are other things that mess with you in terms of when you eat, one of the things that happens is your body gets used to a high level of sugar. It's mostly sugar. There are other things in it where basically you're, you train your body by eating at McDonald's to crave fast food. And so if you all you do is you eat at McDonald's once, the entire rest of your week or the, the rest of your month is basically going to be an uphill battle of eating healthier because you may not know that you have changed the way your body reacts to food, but that is what you have just done. And so, oh, here we are. So we have one Brian Wensink, James Painter, and Jill North, Bottomless Bowls, Why Visual Cues, A Portion Size May Influence Intake. Uh, we've got uh, Portion Size Me, Downsizing Our Consumption Norms, uh, also by Brian Lasnick. Uh, but I don't think that's the one I'm looking for here. But in any case, I'll find it later. The point being is that we'd like to think that we have all this choice. But a lot of the choice has already been made for us by the infrastructure we have to distribute food, i.e. who makes and sells food in your neighborhood. Does your neighborhood have a grocery store? Or do you live in a food desert? And if you don't live in a food desert, how easy is it to access something like McDonald's versus other healthier food choices? These kinds of things sound like it's, oh, it's just my choice whether I eat at McDonald's or not. But one of the problems, one of the things keeping us from eating healthy is how easy access we have to things. And just like for an alcoholic, if you are dependent on alcohol and then suddenly there are uh, booze stores all around you that are opening, it's gonna be hard for you to choose correctly or choose to not fall into the cycle of drinking heavily again. It's the similar things are happening with fast food. And I'm using McDonald's as one example. McDonald's, just having it there is enough to cause a certain percentage of people to fail to eat healthy. And there's many, many layers of how this is kind of playing out, including one of the things, McDonald's actually works with other companies, like I think Subway was one of the ones that's mentioned, to be quote unquote healthy fast food options so that they can say later on, oh, not all fast food is unhealthy, you can always go to Subway. And they'll explicitly use in their internal discussions on the problem of the availability of healthy food, that there are other options, your Subway, et cetera, et cetera. Even though in principle, if you look at the what you're eating at a place like Subway, it still turns out to be, you wind up getting a lot of the same sugars and basically bread. If you have access, free access to bread, chocolate, and what was the other one? It's bread and chocolate and one other, probably something related to sugar. Uh, that alone will probably cause you to, to live an unhealthy life and have a problem with obesity. And so it really does come back to our question of choice and how much choice, if you do have a choice and if everyone has this choice, then there's included in that choice the, the choice to break your own ability to perceive the choice. And that's basically what's happening in the case of things like fast food, things like uh, addictive drugs, is that once you start going down the path, you're actually making future choices for yourself. And so the question of, oh, is this a matter of freedom? Is this a matter of choice? A lot of the choice has already been made. And if we can get to that point, if we can get to the point where we're starting to talk about how much of that choice has already been made, that's a, a lot healthier of a, of a place than where uh, I guess a lot of the discussion has been in terms of just, oh, this is a choice that we're making all the time and we choose to be fat, etc. But it's worth thinking of the longer term impacts of what we're doing now and allowing to, to happen. So those couple of papers really go into that. And it's worth reading if you're interested in the, I guess, pr production of freedom <laughs> uh, at a broad scale, uh, because it really does hit the, where different kinds of freedom and different kinds of choices collide. And it's an observable thing. We can see, oh, the society as a whole is failing to be healthy. Uh, what can we do about it? That sort of thing. But, so there's observable parts and things that we could do differently, etc. But I'm noticing, even after reading this, and one of the things that you learn in this, these couple of papers is that even once you know just how badly the human brain fails on this topic and how not free you actually are, you're still going to choose to eat unhealthy. And once you realize, oh, hey, I'm eating too many calories, 
it's not enough. Even the people who are doing the research, once they see the depth of the problem, even they wind up eating the, the potato chips after the fact. And this is a, a big problem. Like I, I've seen it myself. My diet over the past couple of weeks, it got better for a little while, and then slowly but surely it's been back to whatever is available. In part because I've been self-isolated and I don't really have a lot of choice this week, but even so, I probably could have moderated my portions a little bit better. So it's worth thinking about that particular problem. Another thing that happened this past couple of weeks is I got one of my posts on Twitter uh, censored. So now I am banned from Twitter. My main account is unlocked and I haven't been able to use it for quite a while. But I do have another account that I've been using for really extreme cases where something really needs to be said. And uh, so I'm trying to hold back and not use it so much. Uh, but I do have access to it and so sometimes I kind of break down and use it. But one of the US politicians made a post on the International Day in support of victims of torture. This uh, Secretary Pompeo, which is his actual position. What is his position? Diplomat. Former director of the CIA, uh, Secretary of State. Yeah, I think he's the Secretary of State still. So this is one of the higher ranking people in the US government posting on Twitter. Quote, on the International Day in support of victims of torture, we honor and support victims and survivors of torture around the world. The US is committed to using all available tools, all available tools, to promote accountability for those who engage in these abhorrent practices. Quote, unquote. Now, first of all, it's worth pointing out, like, this is the U U.S. government talking about using available tools to promote accountability for those who torture. So, for example, just like off the top of my head, Abu Ghraib, there was some low-level people who got in a little bit of uh, their wrists slapped, but nobody really was punished for that. Certainly nobody in the Bush administration saw any kind of jail time or anything for that, which is required under international law. It is the available tools are, they do exist, to prosecute torturers. We still do live in a world where, at least on paper, uh, torture is often illegal, and places like the International Court of Justice do have trials to hold people accountable who do torture. But the United States specifically has been involved, both in Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, and then over the years, more and more and more situations and the amount of torture and the people who are involved has been spreading and spreading and spreading. And it got to the point, I think I talked about it a couple of shows ago, where there was a woman who got pulled into the police station, and I think it was Chicago, for a parking violation or speeding violation or something, and somehow got herself arrested through this and wound up being tortured for a like routine speeding thing. Like it wasn't, she's some kind of terrorist and they needed to torture her to get the location of a bomb that was about to go off and kill people. This is just pure sadism on the part of the police who are being empowered across the United States to use the methods of dictators and totalitarian regimes across history to brutalize and cause suffering and deep traumatic damage to people all across the US, and especially in places like Chicago. Chicago is particularly bad for this. So I just like pulled one example out of a hat. Quote, so who are y'all holding accountable for torture at Standing Rock? And I cited a blog post by someone who was making the point that one of the things that happened at the Standing Rock protests a couple of years back under the Obama administration was that the US government, or at least their representatives, used torture on some of the water protectors. And nobody has ever been held accountable for that. Nobody has ever been put in court or to jail because of this use of torture. And it was torture. So who are they holding accountable? What tools are they going to use? And what happened to me when I tried to post this? Well, it says, quote, something went wrong. Something. Notice the big passive voice there. Something went wrong. It wasn't us silencing you, it was something went wrong. But don't fret, let's give it another shot. I try saying something else. Don't say that. My God, we couldn't have you say criticizing the US government, the Trump administration, and their policy on torture. Can't have that. I say something else. Say something happier. Say something that it doesn't ruffle any feathers. But this is what Twitter is. This is what the modern political discourse is. This is why I'm not willing to go on radio. Because if you start talking about things like the legal culpability 
of people in the Canadian and U.S. government to things like torture uh, and crimes against humanity, you're just blocked. And so I wasn't able to post that on Twitter. I was, of course, able to post it on the Fediverse, because that, at least in my instance, there's uh, nothing keeping me from posting that. But on Twitter, you can't see that. You can't hear about that. Now, maybe some other people can get away with saying it, and you can get away with posting other people's blogs. There are ways around the massive censorship on Twitter, but literally hundreds of thousands of people have had their accounts blocked and banned and shadow banned and removed from the search results. And I'm definitely not alone in that. And so when I hear about people here in Saskatoon who are using Twitter to promote their group, that's a problem. It's a problem because only some voices get to be heard on. And if your voice is one of those voices, just keep that in mind. So with that, though, I am getting to the end of the show here. And so I'm going to end with another song. I, I didn't mention where the first one came. These two songs are both from the GNU Funk Radio recording that I made, which means they are uh, of the kind that you can share them, you can remix them, you can do all kinds of cool things to them. Ideally, though, we should have the metadata. We should know uh, who they are. So if you know who either of these two artists are, other than the fact that they were just GNU Funk artists, uh, please get in touch, because I'd like to know both of them, in part because I enjoy both of them, so I kind of want to know. But with that, I'm going to fade out with another one, so hopefully you enjoy this one, and we will see you all next week. This time is moving me